On a warm September day in Millis, Massachusetts, an unknown man called in a bomb threat to the middle school and then shot at a police cruiser, causing it to crash and catch fire. As residents locked down in fear, a massive multi-town manhunt ensued. But one witness, a mailman, would lead law enforcement to the shocking and difficult truth. I'm Brian from Madness and Motive, and this is Small Town Phantom, the Brian Johnson story. Millis is a small but storied town nestled within Norfolk County, about 20 miles southwest of Boston. It is home to approximately 8,500 residents who enjoy its beautiful suburban neighborhoods, sports fields, and tight-knit community. According to Niche.com, Millis is one of the best places to live in Massachusetts, and I'm proud to say that I was born and lived there until I was 27 years old. Millis is part of my DNA, and it's an incredibly safe place to live. As a young teenager, I remember sneaking out during sleepovers to ride bikes through the town in the middle of the night, feeling the cool wind on our faces as we navigated the pavement's imperfections completely carefree. Other than petty vandalism or a cat in a tree, crime isn't something we're used to thinking about or experiencing in Millis. But as we know, terror can strike anywhere and at any time. And on September 2nd, 2015, my hometown's peaceful dream would be broken. It's a hazy August night, and the Millis Select Board meeting is about to start on time at 7 p.m. sharp. In attendance is Police Chief Keith Edison, and he's joined by some veteran police officers, as well as a young up-and-comer representing the next generation to wear the badge in town. It's a part-time officer and former dispatcher by the name of Brian Johnson. At just 24 years old, Johnson excitedly awaits the board's decision on moving him to full-time. Despite the summer air that lingers even well into the night, he wears a dark suit with a purple tie and prepares to hear about his future. He's a 2009 graduate of Millis High School, and after earning his criminal justice degree from Western New England University in Springfield, Mass., about an hour and a half west of Millis, Johnson returned to serve its residents in uniform. As he stood before them, the board approved his full-time employment status and Brian couldn't wipe the smile off of his face. He thanked his family and Chief Edison, and then called the board's decision a blessing. I just want to say thank you to the town, the chief, and the department for the opportunity to serve this town as a police officer. Brian Johnson had graduated high school, he had earned a college degree, and he put in the work to become a town cop. It was time to head out into the field to protect and serve. September 2nd, 2015 was a routine workday for Johnson. It was the first day of school. He started his shift at 7 a.m. and was assigned to traffic enforcement at the joint middle and high school building area. My mom was working as a crossing guard at the time and actually spoke to him that morning. She said he seemed energetic and in good spirits. At the end of their short conversation, she said, be careful out there. These words would become eerily prophetic as the day's events unfolded. Johnson was supposed to end his shift at 11 a.m., but two menacing phone calls came in during the late morning, early afternoon hours, one to the high school and a bomb threat that was called into the middle school later that day. His shift was extended as a response to the threats, and both schools were closed and the students sent home. With their children returned safely, middle and high school families felt a sense of cautious relief. Many of them thought it was probably just a prank or some lunatic trying to stir up chaos. But just before 2.30 p.m., a call came in over the police radio. My cruise has been shot at. I'm on 4th Road. It's going to be dark room pickup. Fellow officers rushed to the scene at the intersection of Forest Road and Birch Street, lights blaring and engines roaring. Upon arrival, they found Brian Johnson's cruiser in the woods just off the road, engulfed in flames, with Johnson visibly upset and out of breath. Here are the details of what happened as recounted by Brian Johnson. He was driving west on Forest Road when he encountered a maroon pickup truck blocking the road. 
As he approached, he noticed the driver clearly displaying a black handgun out the window. Suddenly, the driver fired two shots at him, piercing the cruiser's windshield. Johnson then sped past the truck, and he attempted to turn the cruiser around to give chase, but lost control, causing him to launch forward and crash into the woods. He exited his vehicle and fired three rounds at the fleeing truck, which quickly disappeared. That's when Johnson called in and reported the incident. By the time backup had arrived, the cruiser was completely destroyed as it sat smoldering in the woods next to a tree. Here's a local news report of the event. At 5 o'clock tonight with breaking news, and you are looking live in Millicent. Intense manhunt is heavily underway right now. Armed police officers searching for a suspect. They say open fire on an officer in his patrol car. Tonight we don't know if that officer was hurt, but we do know the cruiser was hit. It crashed and it caught on fire. Investigators do have a suspect in mind. Let's get to New Center 5's Jack Harper live in Millis with more on the manhunt. Jack? Right here at the corner of Forest Street, and that's where it happened further down Forest Street. I want to bring in Mike O'Neill. Mike was over in his yard actually when they went by him, and it was clear to you, Mike, that that cruiser was after this pickup truck. Is that uh, correct? Oh, yeah. The, uh, the truck was really flying. The cruiser was right behind him. He had the lights flashing, the siren blaring. The, the truck was like in the middle of the road trying to, you know, prevent the cruiser from overtaking them. When you last you saw them, they blew through this intersection. Yeah, this is a real dangerous intersection. They went flying through here. Yeah, they did. And then it ended up, thank you, Mike, very much. And then it ended up down the street a little bit. That's where someone involved with that truck, apparently in the truck, got out and or fi fired at this police cruiser. The cruiser was hit twice, we are told. And as you heard earlier, the uh, patrolman then veered off the road. He was not seriously injured, we're told, initially, but we don't have anything officially from the police department. Now, this started, it appears, over at the school, the high school area, where some students and others noticed this truck going round and round the school. Two of the students actually talked with us a little while ago. Bridget Horrigan and Megan, her sister, are both at the high school. We had noticed the maroon truck that they're looking for. Two males, uh, probably like early 30s, one with dark facial hair, were circling around our school and they were like stopping and going and positioning themselves, looking at the top of our building, like pointing out the windows. And we didn't think anything of it, like we weren't suspicious of it, we thought they were just maintenance. And then um, probably like 45 minutes after we were told that we couldn't go outside today and that like that's when the police started to show up. Later on the police were, came and told us that we were in lockdown, we couldn't go outside, we had to stay in our rooms. And then we come home from school today and the school was evacuated, we find out, and then this is happening. So now we're kind of putting pieces together and figuring out that that truck was the one that they're looking for and it was the one that at our school today that we saw. And uh, since then, there's been nothing but police all over the place. You can see another trooper going in now. This street obviously has been a focal point of the investigation, and we have SWAT teams everywhere, helicopters in the air. No arrests have been made. We're not sure if they're looking for two people or one, but we know at least one, and the active scene here in Millis continues. Johnson was taken to Norwood Hospital as a precautionary measure, and as per protocol, a fellow officer relieved him of his duty weapon. Upon the arrival of lead investigators from the district attorney's office, Johnson cooperated by agreeing to accompany them to Forest Road. During this visit, he provided a detailed and articulate account of the events according to those on scene. The incident triggered an extensive law enforcement response involving local police, state troopers, and other assets. Our sleepy suburban town was soon filled with SWAT teams, helicopters, canine units, and police officers armed with assault rifles. Residents were instructed to stay indoors while areas were cleared. The suspect was identified as a Caucasian male with a tan complexion, aged 25 to 40, and armed with a black handgun. It wasn't known if he was still in the area or if he had sped off into a neighboring town. I was living in North Carolina at the time, just two years into a new career, feeling completely helpless as I followed news reports, read stories online, and frequently checked in with my parents about what they were seeing and hearing. For two full days, thousands of people in Millis, the surrounding towns, and loved ones on the outside looking in remained on edge as police searched on the ground and in the air for the suspect 
and the maroon pickup truck that seemingly vanished. A significant turn in the story occurred when a mailman became a critical witness. While delivering mail on Forest Road that afternoon, the postal worker had heard several gunshots but didn't initially find it alarming as occasional shots were not uncommon in that part of town. This account I do take slight issue with because as a longtime resident of Millis, I can say that it would be quite uncommon to hear gunfire anywhere in the town. However, I'm not overly familiar with this part of the town, and it is heavily wooded, so it is possible. Continuing on his route, the postal worker later recounted to investigators that he veered off the main road, heading down a long driveway and into the woods near a house that was tucked away from view. Approximately 70 yards from his location, he spotted a Millis police cruiser parked along a dirt road where an officer was kneeling beside it. Initially, he assumed the officer was just taking a break. The mailman, of course, did not think to contact police until it was spread throughout the town that there was an alleged attack on a police cruiser. Following the shooting incident and armed with this new information from the mailman, Trooper Brian Tully, a lead investigator for the Norfolk County District Attorney's Office, and Lieutenant Gerard Mattigliano, his co-investigator, brought Johnson back for a more rigorous interrogation. Here, they posed a critical question. Why did a mailman witness a Millis police cruiser deep in the woods in a spot that was just half a mile away from where Johnson said the shooting had occurred? While there is no transcript available for this interview, Tully's report documented that Johnson's demeanor changed notably during this conversation. He vehemently denied being in the location described by the mailman, offering terse one-word answers and on occasion becoming quite confrontational. Johnson requested a private conversation with his union representative, at which point investigators concluded the interview and allowed Johnson to go home. He now admitted to being in the woods where the mailman had spotted him. According to Johnson, he had paused to relieve himself, eat a protein bar, and check his phone. He recounted seeing the truck and hearing a gunshot after he re-entered his cruiser, followed by a complex narrative involving accidentally shifting the cruiser into reverse, seeking cover from gunshots, and attempting to pursue the truck. Notably, he failed to activate his lights, sirens, or radio dispatch during any of this. Johnson provided detectives with a map indicating where he had allegedly encountered the truck in the woods off of Forest Road. Mataliano confronted Johnson, highlighting discrepancies between his earlier narrative and this revised version. Johnson cited his deviation from procedural protocol as the reason for his unusual actions and why he had initially told a different story. Throughout the exchange with investigators, Johnson attempted to attribute his confusion to the adrenaline of the experience. After once speaking with such clarity and accuracy, he now struggled to articulate the emotions and thoughts he had experienced during the incident. Mataliano remained unconvinced. Brian Johnson once again requested to speak to his union rep, prompting detectives to end the interview. But just 20 minutes later, they were back in the room together, and Brian Johnson said it. I fired the shots into the cruiser. During this follow-up round of questioning, Johnson's story fell apart. Detectives were the first to hear the shocking revelation of what really happened on that small town back road in Millis, Massachusetts, where nothing ever happens. It was all a lie. There was no truck, no shooting, no danger. He made the whole thing up. Johnson disclosed that in the woods, he discharged his weapon three times, twice into the windshield and once into the rear of the cruiser. He retrieved one of the bullets but left the other two behind. Afterward, he returned to the cruiser and proceeded onto Forest Road. But crashing had not been part of his plan. Johnson thought that he may have blacked out, only regaining consciousness after he collided with the tree. It was at this point that he made the radio call and fired his weapon three times down the street, seemingly toward the imaginary truck. If you recall, before Johnson was taken to the hospital immediately following the event, another officer seized his service weapon. 
but the officer missed Johnson's personal 9mm handgun, which was tucked into his belt. Investigators later located the gun hidden in Johnson's garage, and ballistic testing showed that this was the gun used to fire the shots and stage the attack. Let's listen to a press conference led by Sergeant Dwyer, the acting police chief at the time. Good afternoon, I'm JC Monahan. We are breaking into regular programming to bring you this press conference from Millis regarding the potential shooting at a police cruiser with an officer inside yesterday. Let's hear what he has yesterday to say. Yesterday afternoon, members of the Millis Police Department, along with police from surrounding towns and the state police, responded to Forest Road for the reports of shots being fired into a Millis police cruiser being operated by a part time town officer, or what is called a permanent intermittent officer. The cruiser then went off the road and caught on fire. Over the next several hours, numerous officers, troopers, canine units, and a state police helicopter conducted an intensive search for the reported suspect. Neither the suspect nor the vehicle he was said to be driving was found. An extensive search for ballistic evidence at and around the scene was also conducted. As a result of that search, the only ballistic evidence recovered was that belonging to the part-time officer. Additionally, several interviews were conducted with this officer. Upon conclusion of these interviews, and as a result of all other evidence, we have determined that the officer's story was fabricated, specifically that he fired shots at his own cruiser as part of a plan to concoct a story that he was fired upon. The evidence indicates that the shots were not fired by a suspect and there is no gunman at large in or around the town. The Millis Police will work with the Norfolk District Attorney's Office and the State Police Unit assigned to that office to determine what criminal charges the officer will face. The officer in question was a dispatcher for the department and was hired as a permanent intermittent officer this past June. He was scheduled to begin training to become a full-time officer soon. He will be terminated from the department. Johnson explained to detectives that he had been dealing with some negativity around the station for a few weeks about a relationship he was having with a senior at Millis High School. This became a sensitive issue when a sergeant had advised him to end things, stating that a 24-year-old dating a high school girl didn't reflect well on Johnson or the department. Trooper Tully asked if this plan could have been an attempt to improve his standing with his peers and within the department. To this, Johnson said, I guess that's a good way to describe it. When pushed further on a motive, a reason why he would have done this, Johnson replied with just one word, attention. Tully then asked if Johnson had made the threats to the schools. No, sir, Johnson replied. The topic was set aside and they moved on to other matters, but it was later confirmed that he had made those threats to the schools. At 10.39 a.m., while standing near the school entrance, he placed a call using an iPhone he had taken from the police dispatching center that morning. The effing police are going to be busy today. Better lock your doors, the enraged young man warned the school secretary. Later, during his extended shift, he made the second call at 11.31 a.m., this time conveying that there was a bomb inside the middle school and that the police needed to act swiftly. The following day, Millis police publicly announced the hoax, and Johnson faced a series of charges. Subsequently, he was terminated from his position by the town, and he sought treatment for an undisclosed condition. Sergeant Dwyer, the man from the press conference, acknowledged that something was amiss with Johnson, but said it didn't alter his personal feelings toward him. When he gets the help he needs, you know what? I will still be his friend, he said. A week later, Johnson appeared at the Rentham District Court to face charges where he was swarmed by reporters. He wore the same black suit and purple tie worn during his appearance before the selectmen in August. He was indicted, and the possibility of decades in prison loomed. On Thanksgiving morning at around 3.30 a.m., Johnson was discovered in his bedroom by another resident in the home after tragically taking his own life. A private funeral took place, but no obituary was published. The charges were dismissed, the case files were put away, and the town began its normal strides once again. Soon after the event was discovered to be a hoax, the town came out of lockdown and showed their appreciation and support to the Millis Police Department for everything they did to respond to a perceived threat and to keep the town safe. Thank you so very, very much. We pray for you.
one act of one person does not take away the service of many. That was the theme as hundreds of Millis residents stopped to thank their police. There was no hesitation to take care of our kids. My cruise has been shot at. I'm on Forest Road. It's going to be dark room pickup. Last Wednesday, a young Millis cop, Brian Johnson, turned the town upside down when he claimed he had been fired upon. I just want to say thank you to the town, the chief, and the department for the opportunity to serve this town as a police officer. Earlier this summer, Johnson told Selectman he loved the job. After several interviews, he admitted he had shot up his own cruiser. There was no other gunman. Fire investigators still working to see if the car was also torched. We had no idea what was going on, and neither did they. And they reacted as if our town was in jeopardy, and they did everything they could to keep us safe. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I didn't expect anything, you know, absolutely negative. This show of support has been amazing. Uh, it's a tribute to the community. Sergeant William Dwyer was in charge last week, as puzzled and surprised as everyone by a rookie cop he considers a friend. This week, starting a lot better. And I can't believe this many people came out on a, you know, Labor Day. Years have passed, and this story has fallen into the deep archives of stories and cases that have popped up since. But this one has stayed with me. It's followed me, and every now and then I think of it and wonder, as I always will, why? Why did a young man who was so full of promise, who was achieving his goals, and who had no record of any such behavior, make this baffling decision that saw his life fall to pieces in a single afternoon? Was it all for respect, as detectives suggested? Was it for attention, as Johnson said himself? Or was there something else going on beneath the surface that finally overcame him? We'll likely never know, but whatever the reason, I wish Brian and his family peace, and I hope I've retold this story faithfully and respectfully. That was Small Town Phantom, the Brian Johnson story. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a like and subscribe to the channel. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Thank you.